Well, good morning. My name's Randy Youngblood. I serve as lead pastor, and I'm so glad that you're here for week two of our, of our series. Uh, a few months ago, we asked for questions. Uh, what is it that you'd like to see us address? And those questions formed this series, Views from the Pews. Last week, the question was, are my doubts the reason God doesn't answer my prayers? And if, and if you missed that, you can, it's available online this week question, am I really saved if I keep on sinning? And this week's approach is going to be a little different because the question, um, the qu there were several questions beneath that question, and I'm going to address them all. And so I, I'm just going to bring this up, and I'm going to say a, 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 a little about a lot of things, and so there are going to be a, a number of scriptures. Those of you are um, that like uh, lots of scriptures, you're going to get lots of scriptures. Those of you who, who like to go in depth in a few scriptures, you're going to be a little frustrated. So just jot them down and use them for, for your, um, your time and place with God later. So here's the full context of the question as it was submitted. You mentioned in today's sermon that we can be saved, but our works be burned up in the fire, leaving no fruit of our lives, so to speak. I've never heard that. Please reference. And how sad that would be for a Christian. My husband believes that if you're living in sin, i.e. sexually, even if you're saved, that if you die in the midst of it, you go to hell. Now, nobody's being thrown under the bus here. Uh, this is a really common misconception that I, want to, that I will address. So would you expand on salvation the early years after making that decision, how we can be growing and maybe the grace of God, not just say that we abuse the grace that Paul, as Paul spoke of, but rather not to, not to hear her heart, not to lose hope when we sin, but rather return to God with a humble heart and repent. Now, there's a ton there, and we're going to touch on all of that in 35 minutes. That's what I mean. I'm going to say a little bit about a lot of things, and so take notes, snap pictures, um, and let's just, let's just hold on and, and let's go. I think the question is best answered in the three parts that I broke it up with. The one that says, you mentioned in today's sermon that we can be saved, but our works be burnt up. Where's, where's that come from? And how sad that would be. Um, something that we don't talk a lot about in, in church are rewards of heaven. The rewards in heaven, we talk about the reward of heaven. And there's a scripture that talks about how uh, there's a parable that Jesus told that people, that people who were hired, the parable of the workers who were hired during the day, those who worked the whole day thought their reward would be greater than the others, and they got the same pay. Now, that's not about reward. That's about heaven itself. But there are other parts of heaven that kind of pique my interest and curiosity there. And uh, one of them comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through about 13. Um, and Paul starts this way. He says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to just point out first is that when we talk about the foundation, uh, there's no other foundation of salvation other than, other than Jesus the foundation of our salvation is Jesus. And the good news is that the, the way salvation is found through him, and we're, we're going to talk about that today. But the life that we build on that foundation, how we build our life of faith, is what Paul's talking about. And he says, there is no foundation other than Jesus, and each one should build that life of faith with care. And here's why. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. Now, obviously, those are metaphors, and he doesn't really explain what, they, what, they, what kind of building materials they are, but the if isn't if someone builds, but the if is what they build with. And he says their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, and what's it, why is that day capitalized? It's because it's talking about the day of the Lord when he returns. Mm 
and the day that the Lord returns, um, things are going to be, the, the heavens and the earth as they exist are going to be consumed by fire, and the new heaven and the new earth will come. <coughs> But that fire will also serve a purpose for the individual. And it says, that which we build, it will be shown for what it is. And those things that are temporary, this earth and the heavens as they exist right now are temporary. And everything that we do as we build our lives, we, we invest in the temporary and we invest in the eternal. Our hearts and our minds and our eyes are always drawn towards the temporary. And the flesh always demands satisfaction. And the satisfaction that we feel is in the temporary. But what Paul is saying is that everything you and I invest in the temporary is going to be built up or burnt up. And we can build a life that actually, he says, um, the day will bring it to light. And the light is the presence of God. And he'll show our lives for what they are. He said, it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And here's the next two verses. For if what was built survives, meaning if the fires of that moment test the work, the, found, the building that we've built on the foundation of Jesus, if, if, it, if it survives, there'll be a reward. And... If it is burnt up, meaning we, we lived our lives for temporary benefits and the heavens and the earth as they exist will be consumed with fire, literally, and our works figuratively, he says, that person will be saved, but even though, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Now, I think when Jesus is talking about lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, I think he's talking about this moment. I think he's talking about we invest our lives, we can invest our lives in the temporary or the eternal, and if we live for the, the temporary, he says you can still be saved because you're not saved by works, but you can get into heaven uh, without anything to show for your life on earth. And that's what I, at that moment, the, script, the sermon she's talking about, I said, you get into heaven but naked. Because naked you come into this world and naked you leave. And if everything that we live for is temporary and consumed with fire, you end up with heaven and no treasures invested there. So let those scriptures soak in. But that's what I'm talking about. And I think there's something um, to meditate on there. So, that was part one. Part two, my husband believes that if you're living in sin, i.e. sexually, even if you're saved, that if you die in the midst of it, you go to hell. Now, this is a common view, and let me explain where I think that it comes from. I think it comes from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Now, John writes to Christians... He's writing to people who are already followers of Jesus and have come to a saving faith in him. But what he says here in verse 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I think a false assumption that a lot of people make, and yes, forgiveness of sins is essential for um, salvation, but yet, I also believe that many times people read salvation into every time forgiveness is talked about. From God's perspective, from God's perspective, he, he forgives our sins so that we can have a relationship with him. And the reason God hates sin is because it hurts that relationship. It creates a distance there. And so, John, speaking to Christians who are already saved, he isn't giving this verse as a means to be saved or to regain your salvation or even maintain it. I see this verse, the confession aspect, as essential to maintain fellowship with God. But yet there are many times that people, when they see that forgiveness talked about, they're saying, I am saved. And if you're not careful, unknowingly, you make the mechanical aspect of confession a work unto salvation. What do I mean? If you are only saved 
if all your sin is confessed, you're doomed to hell. I don't know about you, but I'm not aware of every sin that I've committed, let alone be able to ask for forgiveness for each and every one. So if salvation, a condition of salvation, is my ability to know when I've sinned and a willingness to confess it, oh my goodness, what, what an awful existence that would be. And so <clears throat> when we talk about forgiveness here, it's talking about that aspect of, of fellowship and to always equate it with salvation, I think is evidence that, um, that I think you see heaven as your reward rather than God. Because if, if forgiveness is necessary for you to receive your reward and you're only focused on heaven, you're going to be blind to the fellowship aspect. And sin is when you miss the mark. And, and I think this, this message, this is especially comforting to victims of suicide. And when I say victims, I'm not talking about the person who took their own lives. I'm talking about the survivors. Because the number one guilt trip that, that the survivors, the victims of suicide, have to deal with is the Christians who believe you're not saved unless you can repent and confess of each individual sin. And you know what that means? It means that suicide is an unforgivable sin. Now, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is described as an unforgivable sin, but that is the present tense that says continually rejecting God and attributing God's work to Satan. And so, yes, there is an unforgivable sin, and that is the sin of refusing to repent. But, but for those who are in Christ, there is not this flip-flop of lost, saved, lost, saved every time you sin until you can notice it and confess it. And I think it's really cruel, and it's been very comforting to let people know whose loved ones committed suicide that con this confession is not a means for s salvation or regaining salvation that was lost in the latest sin because I don't even know. I'm not even aware of all my sin. And I've had other people say, where do you get that in the Scriptures? And I say, I just... I just know that the idea of sin is missing the mark. And Paul said, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And I believe every time I miss, every time that my thoughts, my motives, my actions, everything that isn't exactly what God would do, I miss the mark. And I'm not aware of every time, let alone having to, uh, to confess every sin. So you can see why this thinking comes from a misunderstanding of the role confession plays in forgiveness. So yes, when you come to Christ, and we're going to touch on this in a little bit when I expound on salvation, but it's not the means for maintaining salvation. It's the means for maintaining and growing a closer relationship and fellowship with, with God. Um, and so, part three <laughs> Would you expand on salvation, the early years after making that decision and how we can be growing? I, I highlighted growing, but it's really that whole phrase in front of that that's going to be a part of that. And maybe the grace of God, not to say that we abuse grace, as Paul spoke of, but rather not to lose hope when we sin, but rather return to God with a humble heart and repent. You know, I can, you can hear that heart that, the heart of not to lose hope. And it can be so discouraging, especially when sin and specific sins keep revisiting and reoccurring. And there are those times in all of our lives that we, that we are asking for forgiveness for the same sins over and over. And that voice of condemnation says, uh, says what a fool are you? Why would he forgive you? Um, and by the way, anytime you hear that voice of it's not conviction, Conviction is the Holy Spirit convicting of sin to lead to repentance, as I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But condemnation is the voice of the evil one says, there's no hope for you, just give up. And so let's expand on salvation, what happens after, those early, after the decision is made, and where does the grace of God come in this? Because I don't want you, I don't want anyone to lose hope. 
by listening to the voice of condemnation. At the same time, I don't want anyone to think that they're saved when they're not. And I'm going to expand on that uh, the best I can in the time as well. So would you expand on salvation? Yes. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So the idea of grace, grace and mercy are, are two sides of the same coin, so to speak. Grace is a gift from God that you don't deserve. Mercy is when, he, when the judge which withholds the punishment that I do deserve. So when I'm guilty of sin and deserving punishment... And Paul said the wages of all sin is death. It's what brought physical death into this world. It's why Jesus' physical death was the solution, the only way for forgiveness. And it's also where spiritual death occurs. Physical death is separation of the spirit from our bodies. When they separate, we're considered dead physically. When our spirits separate from God, we're considered dead spiritually. And so when God gives us, salvation is a gift. It's not something that is earned or merited. There aren't any check boxes that you can check off that says, I'm saved, I've done it. Um, and yet, what is often overlooked, it is by grace, but it is through a relationship of faith that is often misunderstood that I want to touch on today. But while salvation <clears throat> is not earned by works, <clears throat> our faith does work. Our faith does works. And here's what I mean. James uh, says, someone will say, <clears throat> you have faith, I have works. And he says, show me your faith apart from your works. Now, I've said many times, and this is where it comes from, we do what we believe. We can't do one thing and say we believe something else because what we really believe, at least in that moment, is what we did. And all sin is the result of believing a lie that either God won't, like we talked about last week, God won't keep his promises or he needs my help or I've been forgotten or all these lies that we believe for that moment that we think we need to go outside the will of God to enjoy the promises of God. So we do what we believe. And what James says, uh, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by, by my works. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from its works is dead. So some people suggest that Paul and James were um, contradictory and therefore these two doctrines, one has to be wrong. The way I approach the Bible in those moments when there is an apparent contradiction, instead of getting focused on what doesn't seem to fit, I ask a different question. How could they possibly fit together? Because my conviction is that the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, is inspired by God, written through fallible men, producing an infallible work that can be trusted. And so we, if that is your conviction, then you use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And when two things don't seem to fit, what that tells me is I'm about to learn something. And so when I look at that, here's what I learn. And it, it, it even goes back to the Old Testament. Isaiah, I think it's 64, 6, says, Our good deeds are like filthy rags in God's sight. Now, not just any good deeds and not just all good deeds. Good deeds for the purpose of gaining right standing with God. If my desire is for God to look at me and say, you are without sin, come on in. If I'm presenting good works to gain that right standing, to God, that's disgusting. And that's what Paul was talking about. We're saved by grace through faith, not because of our works. 
And yet what James is saying is if you believe that the promises of God are true, you're going to live like it. If you believe, say you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, it's going to be seen in the choices that you make and how you live. And so this is why they're both true. And if someone wants a contradiction so they can throw it all out, they may hang on to that. But if your heart is to really know God and to do his will, you ask a different question, how do they fit together? So faith does work, and faith that does not work is dead. And that's what James says. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you realize how serious that is? There are people, and let's not be naive to think it's only people out there. There are people who call Jesus Lord. They know he's the Son of God. They believe he rose from the dead. They know that that title fits. And there are going to be people who see him on judgment day that say, oh, Lord. <clears throat> and he says, not everyone who knows who I am is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father is in, who is in heaven. Now, how does that fit with Paul and James? It fits. You have to ask, how do they all fit together? And then you submit it to God and let the Holy Spirit teach you. <clears throat> but here's where I think it says, let's keep going. Because he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not look at all the good things we did in your name? In other words, look at all the things we did for you. How could you, what do you mean, how could you not let me into heaven? Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? We taught. We drove out demons. We performed miracles. We did all of these things using your name. And Jesus says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. <clears throat> Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus said, a lot of people will be doing works and expect to be rewarded for those works. And they will, in their minds, know who Jesus is but still be lost. How is that possible? James chapter 2, verse 19, he says, you believe there is one God, good. Before we go on, and you probably already read the next part, let me talk about what that means. You believe there is one God. What that means is you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You believe that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He says, good for you. Demons believe that too, and they shudder with fear. Amen. There are many people, I believe, who are trusting in the faith of a demon for salvation. What do I mean? If you ask someone, if I ask you, <clears throat> why, why do you believe you're saved? And you just tell me, it, because I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he rose from the dead. Is that all, if that's all that your faith is, is something that you think in your head, James is talking to you. When he says, good, even the demons believe that, but they shudder in fear. That scares me as a pastor. Salvation, on the other hand, is a work but it is a work of the Holy Spirit. What do I mean? <clears throat> Paul, in his letter to, uh, to Titus, said that when the kindness and love of, our, of God our Savior appeared, and he's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ, he saved us not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. Now, what did I say was the difference between grace and mercy? Some will, say, some will say, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? To which I say, how can a just God allow anyone in heaven? It's because of his mercy. It's his mercy when he doesn't give us the punishment <clears throat> that we deserve. We, we rebelled before we even knew it. We were, we were enemies of God. And Jesus came to die on the cross to pay for that sin <clears throat> 
and nearly infinitely others. And he saved us not because of anything that we've done. He saved us as an act of mercy. Now, not sending us to hell is mercy. Allowing us into heaven is grace. But look at where he saved us, when. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, you must be born again. Without being born again, no one will see the kingdom of God. How do you put those together? We are born again when the Holy Spirit enters. You're not born because you confessed your sins. You're not born again because you say you repent. You're not born again because you were baptized. You're born again because the Holy Spirit entered in and gave you rebirth and renewal as an act of grace and mercy. Yes. Peter said, and the salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit, but it is initiated by your faith. He's invited in, and not by a sinner's prayer. There are no magic words. There's something about our hearts that only God, the righteous judge, knows. And he is able to judge everyone from the beginning of creation, the beginning of time, to the end of time. He is able to judge each one, and he does it fairly and righteously. On the day of Pentecost, which was the day the church began, the church, with all of its flaws, is God's idea. It's God's idea for us to have community where we can encourage one another to love and obey, to trust him. But on that day when the Spirit came and the church began, Peter, with unusual boldness that he didn't have on the night that Jesus was arrested, stood up and he addressed the crowd and he let them know with no, with, in no uncertain terms that this Jesus that they, who they crucified, God had made him Lord and Christ. And their response at the first time, they recognized they'd been deceived and they had sinned, grievously sinned. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, is there any hope? And Peter said, yes, there is. Repent. And it's important. Everything, everything you need to know and to have a relationship with God is available in your English translations. This is a verse that... Greek doesn't give a different meaning, but it gives different insights. And, to, and I rarely talk about this, but I think it's important right here because it's a very touchy issue, especially regarding the role baptism plays. Some say it's not important. Do it if you feel like it. And others say it's the moment that salvation occurs. What Peter is saying here to people who just realized, oh my goodness, we sinned. Is there any hope? He says... In the second person plural, all of you, yes, turn from your sin and surrender to God. And baptism is also a command in the imperative voice, but it's not in the second person plural. It's not equal to repent. It's in the third person singular. Now, it's translated every one of you because, yes, God's desire is everyone repent and be baptized, but it literally says all of you repent and each one of you who does be baptized. What insights does that give you? It says baptism without repentance is worthless. Baptism without faith is worthless. Baptism is not a work of salvation. It's an expression of faith that leads to repentance. And it is an expression of the faith that led to my repentance and my desire to declare that I have a, a different thought. I have a different priority. My life has going in this direction and I am now dying with Christ and I'm going to live with him and I want everyone to know that I of my desire that he has made me a new creation. So everyone repent and each one who does be baptized. And <clears throat> 
he says, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is the word of the Spirit, but salvation, let me, part two of this section, would you expand on the early years after making the decision? Yes. Salvation is guaranteed by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, Peter said, all of you, every one of you, repent, and each one who does, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, some say, oh, I'm going to speak in tongues. Other, but I think Scripture teaches something far more powerful and beautiful than any single experience. What, are, what about the early years after making that decision? Well, salvation is guaranteed by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, here's what I mean. Peter said, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, this is why. He is the promised Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Have you ever bought a house or your parents bought a house? Have you ever heard of earnest money? This is the word for earnest money. God puts down not cash, but he puts down his Holy Spirit as earnest money, guaranteeing that he will see that transaction through. Every one of you repent, and each one who does be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit promised as a down payment, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. When did this happen? It says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Now, what about sin? Well, what did Jesus say was an important part of the disciple-making process? This is what Jesus said about making disciples. He says, Go, after you've gone, make disciples. And he says, now, here's some more Greek construction. There is one imperative verb there, and that is make disciples. There is an aorist participle, which meant before you make disciples, you got to go. There are two present tense participles. That means while you're making disciples, this is how you're going to do it. And those two participles are baptize and teach. Go make disciples. Make disciples is the imperative verb with all the punch and authority that God could muster. And we baptize, as Paul said. But what's the role of teaching? Teaching them to obey. You see, obedience is a process that doesn't come naturally. And for those of you who see sin as nullifying your salvation... You have to redefine the meaning of this verse because any disobedience is sin. And if, if a part of becoming a disciple is learning to obey, obey it means you, you ain't got it all together. Now, there are some versions of Christianity that teach what they call a second work of grace where you get to this place where you don't sin anymore. And to that, uh, I use a very scriptural term, hogwash. <laughs> I've known pastors of that tradition. I, I know one here in town who retired, and, all, and as much as he had, had as much counseling as he had to have, because what happens is a serious amount of denial and redefining what sin is. You see, because I see any failure of mine to obey as missing the mark, which is literally what the word means, Ha martia, which means miss the mark. And, and the mark isn't just what you're shooting for. It's God's bullseye. Every thought, every motive, every action, every, everything that isn't perfectly bullseyed is ha martia, which is sin. Some of us, we get a little uppity when someone suggests that we've sinned. To me, I don't even know all my sin. And you know what? Because of that, because I'm aware that God has forgiven me a great deal, you know what? I'm able to love much. Whereas some of you who poo-poo the definition of sin and, and, and really narrow it, you think you're kind of doing God a favor. 
I had, had a friend tell me, I don't really feel like my heart's kind of cold because I don't really feel like God's forgiven me much. That's what happens when you use a narrow definition of sin. But when you expand it to anything that misses the mark, you're aware that you've been forgiven as much as anyone else. And there's no one who's been forgiven any more. And there's no one who's been forgiven any less. And it puts us equal only with that right definition of sin. There was a, town, there was a woman in a town who had lived a sinful life. And Jesus was in the home of a Pharisee. And this woman came in with tears with the alabaster jar, very expensive perfume, and anointed Jesus and began to cry at his feet. And the Pharisees, who saw themselves as pretty doggone righteous, judged Jesus that he couldn't be a prophet because if he was a prophet, he'd know how sinful this woman was. And their presupposition was if, if he knew how sinful she was, he wouldn't allow her to touch him or even come into the same room as him. And so Jesus, knowing their thoughts, had a conversation with Peter. And this was his conclusion. He says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And what I say, if your heart's kind of cold towards God, you know, our mission is to reach out, touch lives, and grow people to know, love, and serve Jesus. And part of that knowing Jesus is knowing that he's forgiven me of far more than I even know. And when you know him as he is, your response is going to be to love him. And I'd say, if, you're, if your heart's kind of cold right now towards him, either you're being held captive by sin and you're serving the flesh, or you've defined sin so narrowly that you don't think his forgiveness affects you much. But look what it says here. I tell you, many sins and forgiven. Now, for a long time, I read this and th thought, what's the connection between you have to anoint Jesus' feet and cry over them to be forgiven? No, look at what he says. Her great love has shown what? Her great love has shown that she is aware that her sins, which have been many, have been forgiven. She loved much because she had already been forgiven much. She didn't come begging for mercy. She already had it. And so when we're aware of how much we've been forgiven, so salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit, and it's guaranteed by the indwelling Holy Spirit, but there's more. Would you expand on how we can be growing? Yes. Spiritual maturity is a work of that same indwelling Holy Spirit. What does it mean to grow spiritually? Well, here's my definition Spiritual growth is the ongoing process of surrender. Yeah. It's not something you strive for. It's not something that you work hard to attain. It's surrender. Because I already said every sin is a result of believing a lie. You surrender those lies. You surrender those habits. You surrender those friends. You surrender a way of life. Because it's an ongoing process of surrender where I learn to trust Jesus with things today that I wasn't able to yesterday. This is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit indwelling our lives, our, our very bodies. Jesus said, all this I've spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you things, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I've said to you, which means once you're born again, you don't have it all together. It's a process of growing in your faith and learning to obey means learning to trust Jesus with what he said. Jesus said, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Don't take that in the legalistic sense that says, oh my goodness, I sinned, therefore I, what's wrong with me? No, your desire your desire to repent of that sin and come to him shows the Holy Spirit. My father, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, but this is the part I want you to see. We, we Father, Son, Holy Spirit, will come to them and make our home with them. Abraham himself was someone who was strengthened in his faith as he endured 25 years of trials. 
He was strengthened in his faith. And I take that to mean that Abraham grew stronger in his ability to trust God's faithfulness to keep his promises. Amen. Jesus told a parable. He said, listen to what the parable of the sower means. He says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom of God and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. This is the seed on the path. But look at the seed that was sown in the rocky ground. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word of God and receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. Because when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they think, wait a minute, I didn't expect this. And they fall away. And this, when that happens today, it's people that says, I tried faith and it didn't work. My life was still hard. As we grow spiritually, we become rooted and we become steadfast in our faith as we grow through trials. So fourth, would you expand on what are the limits of the grace of God? Well, salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is guaranteed by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Spiritual maturity is a work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And sanctification, and that is holiness, is a work done in cooperation with the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has two works, one external and one internal. When Jesus said, um, it is to your advantage I go away because the, Holy, the helper, the Holy Spirit will come. But if, if I go, I will send him. And this is what he does. It says, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, the world is not the subset that we call believers. It's everybody. Believers, it's beyond, it's pre-belief. It says the role of the Holy Spirit is to work external to the believer. We've already seen that when someone comes to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit becomes internal. But prior to that moment, he is external, but God is always at work. And what's he doing? He's calling people to repentance. He is convicting people of the realities of sin the need for righteousness that we don't possess, and specifically the moment that it will become necessary, and that is judgment. The evil spirit, the voice of condemnation says, you're so far gone, there's no hope, just give up and live like you please. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, is convicting people of sin to lead to repentance, to gain hope, not to lose it. And so the role of the Holy Spirit is externally for the world to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the second work of the Holy Spirit is internal for believers. And Jesus said, I have much more to say, but when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And so, am I really saved if I keep on sinning? I can only ask you the questions that help you to decide. I can't tell you the first question, were you saved in the first place? Were you saved in the first place or are you depending on the faith of a demon for your salvation? Secondly, and you kind of say, how do I know that? Well, do you recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? That voice of truth, the voice that is leading you to a closer walk with him and third, and most importantly, does the Holy Spirit lead you to repentance? Does the Holy Spirit lead you to repentance? Because when you're saying, oh my goodness, if I sin, will I go to hell? What I'm saying is, when you feel the conviction of sin, repent. So, Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray you'll give us each insight into what your word means to us today. That you, would, that you would bring hope, restore hope, that you would lead to salvation. Um, and for those of us that are held captive by the lies 
of the evil one and the voice of the spirit of condemnation, I pray you would set us free with truth. For where the truth of the Lord is, where there's truth, there is freedom. And I pray we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Amen.